Welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I was a little bit late walking in today. Had but some you, issues. It was a miracle that you were here, though. We were expecting you to be another 10 to 15 right. minutes late. When we started the show this morning, my phone rang and I said, it's Nancy. And it was you calling me saying that you were having some, you, you need to take care of something with Wyatt. With Wyatt, and we, yeah. And we always say that takes precedence because right. first and foremost, we're right, autism moms. And yeah, and so uh, we weren't expecting you to be that. I thought I was on my own for in the news. So oh, okay, well here I uh, am. So there you are. So here I am. Uh, excited to be. I had said to them earlier this morning too that one of the things I want to talk about today is that I just feel at sea. My house looks like I'm just gonna lay it out there and be. My house looks like. Um, somebody who's insane went through and just threw things in different directions. Mine, mine's not looking so good either. Oh man, and I and I, there's no food in the refrigerator. No food in our refrigerator. No, my child hasn't eaten a vegetable in days. <laughs> and the and the laundry, I I did a lot of laundry over the weekend, but I'm still not caught up. Yeah, I don't know what. Maybe it's the impending doom feeling of school starting I guess or it's just that like the time of year or it's that transition thing yeah, transitions are hard to, for our to, kids but they're hard for us and yeah. I uh, somebody was telling me the other day they felt guilty that they were anxious for school to start and that made them anxious. a horrible mom and you know me I'm always like ooh school's out like I, I I'm excited about school starting um I, ha I had some concerns about it I don't anymore and I, I, I need some normalcy. I need a regulated schedule again. I, it feels like the end of the holiday break right. um, where you know, you've eaten all the sugar yeah. and it's like time to eat a salad again I, I and so you want regimented. You. I so hear you. I, I'm glad you don't have any, any you know, feelings about school, any apprehension. I no. have tons. Um, uh, you have tons this yes, year? Yes, tons this year. Really? Yeah. Maybe yeah. we need to talk about that. I, you know, I was nervous all this last week. Jem had, you know, a starter sort of thing that he was doing for two days the last two days, which was going to be his first entree into this new school and new people. And it went and well? It went really well. It went okay. better than, you know, the most, the highest expectations that I could have, from what I'm hearing from him, who knows okay. what they think. But he had a great time and enjoyed it and can't wait to go back to school um, next week. So we're, we're excited about that. That's fantastic. Um, I, you know, uh, nothing is ever going to be perfect. Right, right, right. And I'm, but I was, I'm a lot less anxious than I was because yesterday Good. you could have bounced a quarter off my head. Right. Uh, <laughs> I was just so wound so tight, like, ah. And I, I was telling you, I moved heaven and earth to pack him a gluten-free lunch because they were going to provide lunch at a place that he couldn't do lunch. And I, we bought a new lunchbox and everything. And you know all the steps that we take, how yeah. we overdo be, to make it right. Right. And, and my husband drove to the special sandwich shop that had, I got to take you to this place in Burbank, Ike's Loving Sandwiches. Yeah. Uh, Gluten-free gluten bread. <gasps> That's so good. You'll so die. Okay. Oh my gosh, it's so good. And so my husband drove all the way there to get the special sandwich and we're keeping it cold. And it sat there on the kitchen table and Gem and I both left and neither one of us grabbed it. Well, the reason why I'm late this morning is because it's swim day at camp and I forgot why it's bathing suit and towel. And and, and I sister, drive back home, get it, you know. And, and I didn't have time to go back home to get the lunch. So I was a crazy woman running through a Ralph's grocery store going, where's the gluten-free bread? <laughs> <laughs> and, and like what can I and I had like eight people working in the store that were running around getting ingredients for me because I had eight minutes to get it back before the bus was leaving it was insanity I, and what, I couldn't breathe one of the things that stresses me out the most is having to get the school supplies yeah that stresses me out and also having to go on all the different websites because everything's on the web now and I don't have anybody at home helping me with that it's just me and, and, and you have I'm to go a, on a bunch of websites? Yeah, because Wyatt's classes are all on the internet, his assignments. <sighs> yeah. And they're and all separate? A lot of them are separate, yeah. Oh, that we need to have a talk with the school. I know. How does that work for anybody? I, I don't know. That's what I wondered That's all last year. That's an executive functions nightmare it, ex for anybody. Exactly. Anyway, uh, so we're all proclaimed. Yes, there's a lot going on. And I know it's not just us. A dear friend that's an autism mom had posted something yesterday and said, you know, I, I don't have laundry, I don't have groceries, and you know, work is this, and, and I was like, okay, it's not just you, it's right. not just me, right. it's Good not just know. her, it's a thing. So write in and tell us if you're, okay. if you're, if you're having a week like that having, too. 
the same issues that we are. But it's just going to be a matter of time, and then the kids are going to be back to school. And at least then... It seems like we were just there five seconds ago. We this were. Summer this has been flew. the shortest summer. But, but at least then, I think we all do better when we have a schedule. I do, too, for sure. Uh, I, I will say this, too. This morning, I was so excited to hear that David Letterman is coming back to television. He's going Oh, to be, is he? He is. And I didn't I, hear you that. know I love me some David right. Letterman. And apparently, it's going to be on Netflix or something. Okay. He's going to do a different sort of talk show. And and my husband said, uh, when, when asked why David Letterman was going to do this, he said, you know, when you take off time to be with your family, it's always best to ask your family if they wanted time with you. Right. And that he forgot to do that. And I said, but you know what? I, I think David Letterman, I, you know, if it's structure. When you have to come in every day and you have to go to work, whether it's a show or something else, it's structure. I always say, oh, I, oh, I want some time off. I want some time off. But I don't do well with time off. I don't either. Right? I feel structure. I, yeah. I feel I, I feel out of control when I have time off. Yeah, a little bit is good every yeah. now and then, but structure, 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 and that's our kids too. So is that any sure surprise? is our kids. Okay, we so got some in the news. news. Yes. Um, uh, you want to start? Let's see. This mother of three who is investigated by police doctor claiming she used bleach to try to cure her son's autism. Yeah. On a secret Facebook group. And we've touched on this subject a little bit before because there's been a lot of hubbub surrounding. Um, therapies and things that are not scientifically proven and sometimes they're dangerous. Yes. And there is uh, a thing that some people refer to it as CD. Yeah, chloride it's, dioxide. And some people refer to it as MMS, which is Master Miracle Solution. And what it is, is industrial bleach right. that people are giving to their children orally or by enema. And there, there is a, a secret Facebook group, apparently, where you have to pay a monthly fee to be a part of the group. And parents post pictures of things coming out of their children's intestines that they say are bacteria and parasites. And parasites. Um, but doctors look at it and say, no, what you're seeing in those pictures is not parasites. That is the burnt out lining of those children's mm. intestines. So I want to make sure that our audience knows that this is, even on their own website, they have cautionary statements about the fact that right. it's not an approved treatment, that, that you can get in trouble for using mm -hmm. it, and that you should hide your supplies if officials come to your home. Now, come on. We have to use some common sense. We all want to do things that help our children, but we have to use some common sense um, and and this is harming yeah. children. It's not illegal yet, so there are a lot of the experts saying that it should be illegal. And it said that the most extreme case was a six-year-old boy who had to have his bowel removed and a colostomy bag fitted after his parents gave him the animals. And And part of who is touting this product is a church that's called the Genesis 2 Church. Um, they are very strong in England and in Ireland, and they have a chapter here in Southern California. And on their website, I don't know what I don't know what the arrangement is, but they advertise this on their website. Um, so it's been touted as being a cure for cancer, HIV, malaria, Alzheimer's, and autism. Um, it is uh, not a good thing. Kids no. are being hurt, um, and they're asking officials are asking you if you are using this to, if you own some of it, to throw it away mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. And if you think that your child has in any way um, ingested it and might have be, because these parents are reporting on the site that their children are weak, that they can't get out right, of bed. Right. Um, if your child is having any symptoms at all, do not hesitate, take them immediately to seek out medical attention that it, it could be a matter of life and death. So, you know, please take heed. Mineral Miracle Mineral Solution, Miracle Mineral Supplement are two other uh, names for it, and um, it's nasty stuff. It's yes. bleach yes. burning yeah. their intestines, not something that is good for them. Uh, okay, shall we move on to um, th rethinking regressive yes. uh, regression and autism? So I want to encourage people to check out in Spectrum News at spectrumnews.org. There's a really interesting article right now about regression and autism that kind of goes through the history 
of we've been saying for years that that we know that it's not just autism that there's autisms yes and i didn't realize i i guess i was undereducated on this that officials have referred for a long time since the beginning of autism mm -hmm. because canner is the one who started it of uh be there's two different types of autism one being innate and one being regressive mm -hmm. i didn't know that those were the words that we were using because um there aren't it does seem like there that there were two categories yes that some kids just never made progress. I always ask my friends that. Did your child make progress or did your child regress? Right. And it seems like the vast majority of parents I talked to said their child regressed. Right. And studies have shown at different times a different percentage. And this article kind of sheds some light on to why that might be. And doctors have said we need to throw away this whole innate um, and regressive for a new model. They For a while they've been using something where they had early onset delay in regression, plateau, and then regression. And they've said mm -hmm. even that doesn't begin to cover. I mean, we both had kids who regressed, who but regressed. I think they regressed in, in vastly different ways. Yes. And that's really what this article talks about, that researchers are now saying we've got to stop looking at this in such a narrow focus. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I found really interesting was even the kids that regressed later, yes. like our kids did, right. Um, that I felt like there were no symptoms of anything before 18 months. I right. just really wasn't seeing them. They reviewed tapes and they went back through pediatrician notes and mm -hmm. clinician notes and said, once you know what the diagnosis is, when you go back, you can see, you can see those that there are evidence. that there are symptoms before, and that it isn't as you know for people who say it was like a light switch that got flicked right. off. They're like, mm, not really. There there are some um, markers early on. Right. Um, that the parents that show. have missed. Yeah. And that they think that the regression isn't as uh, instantaneous as we've been led to believe that it is mm -hmm. in some kids. For my son, it was very slow and It ugly. was a slow regression for my son as there well. There you go. Yeah. And they're finding that that's more and more the case. Yeah. But because no one apparently has defined what to call a uh, regression, they haven't been able to get clear studies about who's regressing how much because... Everybody's been looking at it at, diff at different. Some people just say it's regression if they lose language. Right. But not all kids lose language. Some of them lose other skills. Mm -hmm. So very interesting article. Again, yeah, go to spectrumnews.org spectrum um, and read off about that. It's, it goes into the whole what Canner said, what Bettelheim said, uh, and why we're kind of stuck with this thing that doesn't work because of Canner, and we don't want to be stuck with that. Right. Um, in any case, uh, I added a new um, story here too that I don't I don't know if you saw that. But did you did any of you get a chance to see this last week on Vice? They did um, the entire half hour on autism, and it was a really interesting in depth article that showed a bunch of research that isn't mainstream. Uh, research. We cover a lot of research. There were at least two studies that they talked about that I had never heard really? of before. So I think it's a really, it's still playing all this week. Autism Under the Lens, it's called. Yeah. And it's uh, Gianna Taboni is one of the, one of their, she's amazing. I, I know you would love her. Um, investigative journalist mm -hmm. that goes around the world. I can't imagine. She's this beautiful, tiny little thing. And she go, walks into things that you just think, how, do, how did she survive? Um, I love uh, to watch Vice and see some of the stories that they um, show. So this was really interesting. And, of course, it featured John Elder Robeson uh -huh. talking about it. One of the things that I thought was particularly interesting was they went into the whole self-advocate movement mm -hmm. of people who were saying, um, you know, we welcome neurodiversity. neurodiversity. And why we don't did, need to be cured. We don't, we don't need to be cured. I thought that John Elder Robeson was very interesting because he has done – some of that new electromagnetic um, stuff on the brain right. where they put the magnets on the right, brain. And, right. and his description of it is, you've got to see it, you guys. It was really, really fascinating um, to see him talk about how he felt afterwards. Uh, I want to do more shows about that. But um, but he, he's somebody who has been a self-advocate who says, you know, we're neurodiverse. Yeah, nothing but nothing then, to be fixed here. But then he did a therapy that to quote unquote, change how he looked at the world. Right. And then he looked at the world in a different way. It's yeah. not as clear cut for him anymore. Right. But there was one scientist who 
I thought made a statement that he put it in the best way that I've heard anybody say it. I, I will murder it, so you need to go and watch it. It's on HBO this week. But he basically said, look, we've got all these wonderful self-advocates who need to be listened to. We need to listen to what these adults say. But if we only listen to them, then we're letting out a whole other subset of this autism community, which are children who are nonverbal right. and need therapies yes. to be able to communicate. And he said, you have to be able to find the, the marriage between listening to the adults who are on the spectrum, but also listening to the families of the kids that don't have a voice otherwise. And to do anything else is a disservice. And to just always keep in mind it's a spectrum disorder and there are some kids that are severely affected that their parents don't think it's a blessing. Yes. Nor would maybe the child, if the child were able to talk. Yes. Um, with some severe behaviors. Yes. You know, those those children that are affected by not only lack of, that are nonverbal, but really the behaviors that oh, are so yeah. destructive. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very interesting debate that rages on. Uh, because, of course, we all believe in nothing about us without us. That's We want to have and as many people having a voice that, that are affected by autism as possible. But when you have a child who has no way of typing out what they want or communicating it, we can't leave them out of the conversation. Right. And you have to give room for their proxy, which is often their parents, to have a voice for them. Mm -hmm. And I know that's complicated, but it, it is it's a necessity. It is a necessity. Um, but then I also, there's a new study that's out this morning that I just added, and I think it's in your no, packet, I, Nancy. I, yeah, but I didn't get a chance to preview this. Let, let, me, yeah, let me give you just a little bit of background on this. There's a, a study about music therapy and autism. And the headline is that researchers saw no benefits when comparing music therapy with standard care for children with autism. Um, but... There's always an asterisk, right? And I love the fact that in doing this show, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox always taught me, okay, don't just go for the headline. You got to right. read what's being compared to what's mm -hmm. being compared. Because if it's apples to oranges, you know, you can't really compare that. So the, the standard care for children with autism that they looked at was what's happening in uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in Norway is just speech and OT and some sensory integration. Okay. Now that's not a standard of care anywhere else in the world. The gold standard of treatment is ABA. Mm -hmm. So they didn't look at children who are getting ABA therapy and then getting musical therapy in conjunction with ABA. What they saw was that these kids that are getting this Norwegian standard of care and had musical therapy weren't making a whole lot of progress. Okay. Well, we've already done that study. Right, exactly. But so I don't know how you can say if, if you give something that you know isn't effective and you put something else on top of it and it's not effective, then, then neither thing is effective. For me, that's not an if, P, then, Q. Right. We don't know... You still don't have the study, and plus which, and I and I love that this article, uh, we're looking at the CNN article, but it's all over the news today. It, we do go into the fact that individuals are individuals. So for one person, musical therapy is not going to be reinforcing. Exactly. And just so like that's therapy, not going to be effective. Like it would be like, like if somebody gave me physics therapy, mm -hmm. I wouldn't make a whole lot of progress because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm not interested in that. But if you give me something I am interested in, I might make a lot of progress. I've never heard musical therapy touted as a, a benchmark uh, treatment for children with autism. Well, that, there are that people can, quote cure them. Right. Well, there are people who, I mean, we never want to say we're done, right? Mm -hmm. I, we know that ABA is effective, and you know I'm a huge fan of ABA, and I say get the ABA, follow the science, get the ABA. But I personally believe pair it with other things and let's not stop. Exactly. Let's keep looking for yeah, more things that are effective. And for one kid, we, we see it all the time that look at Spencer Hart, for heaven's sake. Right. Here's this young woman who was barely speaking and watched Phantom of the Opera and then began to sing. And she yeah. is a social butterfly flying around the world and meeting people. So it's highly individualized. Yes. Yes. But that wouldn't be the same for, for somebody else. But... To say that it's not effective when you're doing what what you already know isn't effective right. makes me mad. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> anyway, okay. 
We'll take a breath. And we've got a great guest coming up in the, the next half of our show. This fabulous book that you've got here. Yes. Uh, I mentioned this at the top of the show. Jen Fill in the Slade. Mm -hmm. uh, she is the author and the illustrator of this I. I, my husband tells me all the time they're called graphic novels. Okay, graphic novels. I still novel. think comic book. Um, but it is, uh, and it's set up like a frame-by-frame -frame comic book. It's called Cartoon Junk Food by her. Fabulous. So uh, she's going to be here with us in the studio and talking about what has driven her to want to write these kinds of books about starring a uh, you know, main Kids character, on Kid on the Kid Spectrum. On the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, so she's going to be with us in just a few minutes. What is autism? 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 I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> trying to, uh, just, uh... Um... Let me think. <laughs> Oh man, that's a tough one. Yes. Uh, autism. Uh, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability, and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another, it's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Day, One Hope Act Today for Military Families Run and Festival, and it's to benefit uh, military families challenged by autism. So we're out here for a great day. Not only is there a 10K run, a 5K run, and a one-mile fun run, there's a kids run and a, um, there's an Easter egg hunt. Military families are particularly hard hit um, because they have very special circumstances. I have three kids in my family. You know, my nephew has three children that are all on the spectrum. And um, for me, it, be, it, it, it originally became about uh, understanding and learning about autism. And then it became about, you know, what can I do to help? It takes $3 million to raise, raise a child through their lifetime with autism. That's a great reason to get involved. On your mark, get set. One Hope Wine is the seventh annual title sponsor of the One Hope Act today for military families uh, because we believe that giving back is good business. Of age runners are probably going to meander over to the One Hope and Stone Beer and Wine Garden for a celebratory glass. For the younger generation, yeah, the family fun zone. This is a big thing for us because uh, it's about getting more treatments, more people, raising awareness. Um, it's a really, it's a really good event. We're proud to be a part of it for seven years now, um, and we're we're a local office, so we wanted to be here. Stroller Warriors is a free running club for military spouses and their families. A lot of us are impacted by autism, so it's just a great way for us to get together and raise some money and bring attention to this important cause. I, 
I think people forget the the people element involved with aut with autism. You know, the families that, that are, are suffering, the children that are suffering. Society could be robbed of so much untapped potential, talent, and skills if we're not helping the children of these military families as much as any other children out there. Not just those suffering with autism, but those struggling. People should get together and tell their friends and family to donate to ACT Today. It's a really important cause, one that's close to our heart and the San Diego community as a whole, and an incredible opportunity to support the military. So get out there and donate. And we are back now with Let's Talk Autism, and we are now joined in the studio by Jen Slay, who, as we promised, is going to tell us a little bit about her book, Fill in the Blank, Quirks and All, and about her brand um, and what she's trying to do with this series of books, what you mm -hmm. hope to be a series. But first, tell us about you, Jen, and your background. Um, I am from New Jersey and went to school for animation in Philadelphia. Um, when I was 12, I did a volunteer newspaper that was kind of like a far side style. Right. And then from then on, it was like, okay, I'm doing cartoons. That's my thing. And so I went to school in Philadelphia at UArts and got my bachelor's in animation. And then after that, a group of friends and I decided to move to California because that's where all the animation is. Mm -hmm. And um, I slowly started to see how 3D was becoming the thing, and my thing was traditional. So. I was kind of doing jobs here and there, and then I got into teaching animation with a bunch of animators. We would go school to school and teach uh, kids how to do 30-second animations on non-smoking. Mm. And then from there, I found a job where I was teaching kids with autism. And I had zero background with autism and had no idea what I was getting into. And from day one, it, it was just fascinating beyond my belief. Every day is different. Even now, I've been there nine years. Every single day is different, and um, so you found a home. I did, yeah. and um, and from there I decided to get my special ed teaching degree. So, while I was working on my cartoons, I was teaching full time and doing my teaching degree at night. Um, and at some point, I was watching TV and I heard the phrase "fill in the blank," and I thought, in my own cartoon way, I thought that'd be cool as a character name. Fill in the blank. So then the I just started down. writing. From there, I just started okay. writing that night coming up with ideas, and then I thought, how cool would that be if the kid had autism and he was living in this blank world, a world that we don't understand. Right. Um, and I had also remembered that I read somewhere that a parent was saying, I wish that people would focus on kids who are nonverbal or lower because they don't get any recognition. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see any cartoons because I don't think anybody knows how to go about it. Right. So I decided, well, I have nine years experience, I'm going to try and do a comic book. So you came up with this book, yeah. fill in the blank, quirks and all, and it's about a nonverbal boy with autism who struggles being understood, and tell us he lives in his imagination, how does this, what are the other characters in the book? Um, so it begins, the whole book is an intro, this is going to be at the beginning, okay. so there are definitely going to be some more. Um, it starts out with him playing in the in the woods and he likes autumn and he's running through the leaves and he lands in a pile of leaves and he, he lands on a weed and the weed jumps up and says, hey, what are you doing? Watch where you're going. And he's like alarmed, like, you, you're talking to me? How can you hear me? And from there he starts talking to a tree and a sunflower and he's blown, like his mind's like, what's going on? And um, from there, they start talking, they say they're going to be here for him, they're going to help him through his problems. And then next story, I go into some sensory where he's playing with lights on and off. Mm -hmm. And um, I broke up the comic book into sensory and problems. So okay. between each scene, so we went from intro to sensory, the next scene is his daily life again. And he's going through a problem. And then he goes to his mom and he goes to his friends in the woods and they work out a problem. And then the next one is a sensory. So it's kind of like a little break between stories. Mm -hmm. The one after that is noise and sensory where he's getting up in the morning and there's too much going on. So you actually get into, into his head and yeah. his mindset. Yeah. And help him and show us through the book how he really feels and what he's thinking. Yeah. And 
at first I thought, well, I don't have autism, so why should I be writing this? And how can I make that up, right? So I actually got in touch with Ito and Tito. Um, Ito wrote me back, and he gave me some feedback on this. And he told me that he thought it was pretty. For, the, for everybody at home, would oh. you explain who Ito and Tito <laughs> are in case that they don't know? Um, Ito wrote a book called Ito and uh, Autism Land. And he struggles or has struggled with being severe and nonverbal. And in his book, he talks about um, how frustrated he is and how ignored he is and how much he really knows, but nobody else knows right. because he can't get it out. Right. They assume non-intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from a lot of what I read, I thought, oh, wow, like for me, pictures came up and ideas and cartoons and colors and all this stuff came to my head. And I thought, wow, this would be great. My background, my favorites growing up were Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this would be a great like Calvin and Hobbes-esque take on it with autism. So with that in mind, I wanted to make sure he respected what I was doing. I didn't want to be making up what the truth is. I want the character to be true. Right. So I made sure that was OK. And I kept checking in with him while I was working on it. So I felt good. I felt like I wasn't you know, just making up stuff. And you got <laughs> his stamp of approval. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got some pictures that uh, that we want to show. That Go ahead, uh, Samantha. So is this how you storyboard? Yeah, so this is after I've come up with some ideas. The picture on the left is one of the sensory scenes where he's waking up, the alarm clock gets to him, and he screams and runs out of the room. And then the whole scene is all, it's all just... Um, visuals, there is no dialogue. Okay. And you just see him run through the house and he's going through all the noise issues he has. It's, but it's so clear, uh, I have to say, and, and the, your, your drawings are so compelling and I'm so glad that you said the Calvin and Hobbes because it really, there is something about the colors that you choose that it's, it's very reminiscent of that. Yeah. Uh, interesting. And uh, I, we, you particularly uh, were drawn to the segment about the sweatpants. Yes, I was <laughs> because my son can't handle wearing jeans or hard clothing. Yeah. And he's always in gym shorts and sweatpants. Yeah. And, you know, I never thought about the fact that he maybe feels at times he doesn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And um, Phil has this issue. Yeah. And comes to a solution. Um, yeah. To put sweat pads inside the jeans, right? Yeah. So I um, have students who wear sweats every day, nonstop. And I tried to put them in um, a regular school, a typical school, and put them in place of somebody who doesn't understand how uncomfortable clothes are. And wanted the friends of his in the forest to help come up with a, an idea. Yeah. And um, so the flower came up with helping him combine sweats with jeans. Right. So right. he kind of tricks his friends into looking cool, which is but a being comfortable. Thing. So uh, you envision this as a series of books, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at some point, will there be a cartoon? Do you I think? hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm now starting to um, present it at animation expos. Mm -hmm. I did a small one at uh, CTNX, Creative Talent Network. They do a road trip short, kind of like uh, farmer's market style mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. setup where you go outside, you just walk around, and you can see artists, right? Mm -hmm. And I presented my book there, and I got to meet a lot of people who have family in the autism community, so a lot of people that work in schools and are therapists. And, and luckily, it was, it was right at the end of April. So we got squeezed it right into um, Autism Awareness Month. Oh, and, um, and yeah, it was, it was really great meeting all these people. So how, do you, how can people get the book now? Um, you can go to Amazon and type in fill in the blank, but you have to put the second L, because I know nobody spells fill with two Ls. OK. But that was a play on word, fill right. in the blank, fill in the blank. Right. So um, that's the only thing. And so P-H-I-L-L. -L in the blank and they can also search by you jen j-e-n-n -N, slade yeah s-l-a-d-e uh to be able to get the book so it's on amazon mm -hmm. and do you have a website where people can go for more information about what you do um i made a website for phil so he has his own cartoon website okay. and it's called fillintheblank.com and there's a link there for his book and he talks about the book on the page and there's pictures of the storyboards and the paintings and then there's a link to my website it's called cartoonjunkfood.com, which is my portfolio and my own personal work. Okay. And on that site, you can also go to Amazon. So they're all linked together. 
And so I'm sure you've had the opportunity to show this to kids that are on the spectrum. What's been the reaction? Oh my gosh, they love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. of course. And a lot of them will just say, this is me. Uh, or yeah. at, the art, at the art exhibit I went to, one of the um, brothers of a kid who has severe autism came up and he's just thumbing through it and he goes, this is my brother. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was just, it just hit my heart. So it was just right. like, I, I got it. Right on the right on the it nose. Must be an amazing feeling knowing you're connecting. With yeah, I mean, I wanted to do it right. I wanted to make sure it was real, mm -hmm. and it was really real to these people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's super important for everybody to be able to see themselves in literature and in art. And you know, I always think about Whoopi Goldberg talking mm -hmm. about how amazing it was for her as a young woman watching Star Trek, and she saw Lieutenant Uhura, mm -hmm. this woman who, you know, had skin like hers, right. and who was the communications director on an international federation. Starship, and it gave her permission to do whatever. Right. We always need to give our kids on this the, the spectrum people to look up to, role models, mm -hmm. and people that they just identify with and say, see, you're counted. We see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That cannot be understated. So what a wonderful gift. If mm -hmm. you have a, a friend who has a child who's nonverbal and you're looking to give them something even or you're if a they're parent. Not, even if they're not nonverbal, I think this oh, child is so relatable. I mean, I go through these things. Yeah. I mean, when he the school picture day is in the book. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Um, what happens for school picture oh, day. So yes. with kids with autism, whether it's severe or not, they have a hard time um, with connecting <laughs> their brain with their actions. Yeah. And so my take on this was he's really freaked out because he's got to go home and prepare for picture day and he's afraid he's not going to be able to smile when there's a camera in his face uh, which is normal for all of right, us yes and um so he goes home and he's stretching his face and he's trying to get it right in the in the the mirror and his mom's like just go practice and he's in the in his mind he's going well it's easy for you to say because your face moves when you ask it to right mine doesn't so he goes to his friends in the woods and they practice and they give him some ideas so when he goes to his pictures, he's more comfortable and he's ready for it. That's really wonderful. And, and I started by saying, if you know somebody who's got a child who's nonverbal, but as you were saying, it's good for everybody. And for those of you who have friends who are always like, what can I do to help? And what we all want is for our kids to feel included. Mm -hmm. So this is a great book to give. So they, they have, they'll, they'll love the book. Mm -hmm. They're not even going to process all of it. But later on when they go, why doesn't Billy talk? Well, Billy's like Phil. Yeah. You have that basis for explaining to the child, oh, Billy's like Phil. Mm -hmm. Phil's great. So mm -hmm. but Billy's okay. Mm -hmm. um, great, great tool for inclusion. And I think for, um, you know, sisters and brothers that have siblings with autism, yes. then they'll know how to communicate back and forth. They'll right. know how to answer questions to their friends at school, and they won't feel so, I don't know how to answer this mm -hmm. or you know, stick up for my brother, Right, exactly. it'll be more natural for right. them. You do a great job of just getting us inside the head of this child, mm -hmm. I must say. Yes, with, with sometimes with no words at all, yeah. other times with words. Those are the more fun parts, actually. All right, yeah. they're very fun. So fill in the blank, blank. P-H-I-L-L -L in the blank. Quirks and all. Yeah. Uh, and Jen Slade. Mm -hmm. Jen Slade, and so uh, Amazon.com, you can get it there. Mm -hmm. But tell us the, your website again that's um, that's all your my stuff. Your stuff, yeah. Is cartoonjunkfood.com. Okay. We okay. love that. All right, Jen. Thank you so much. Thank you much for being for here. Love, this. love the book. Yeah, check out the book. I'm actually going to bring it home for, and oh. we'll have my son take sure. a look at it. There you <laughs> go. He's really going to relate to it. All right, we're going to be back with more Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy after these messages. I am Alexis Weinman at the Future Horizons uh, Super Conference in Dallas, Texas. It helped me in a way because it was a format that I was not used to. Like, I had never curled my hair before. I've never worn heels. I didn't know what foundation was. And it was just, uh, it was a very, like, it helped me more in a business sense. Like, I know how to present myself in front of people now. That's, that's something my mom drilled into my head. Um, I have trouble sometimes with it. Like, you introduced yourself to me downstairs, and so I immediately like, and I've heard of you before, so I was like, I know this person, I can make eye contact with this person. And um, if I'm talking to someone I don't know, or if I'm listening to someone give a speech, most of the time my head will be down. I don't look at people in the eye, but if it's someone I know I need to make eye contact with, I make eye contact. 
but my mom growing up, she, uh, especially after the diagnosis, she would always like grab my hand if I was like, you know, looking everywhere else but home, and she'd like say, look me in the eye, and so she wouldn't let go of my hand until I looked her in the eye. I do feel like I have to do play poet because, you know, sometimes there'll be jokes I don't understand, but I'll laugh at anyway. Uh, there'll be uh, situations that I'm not comfortable with, but I'm going to have to play along anyway. And uh, I, th I think I just found out, like, I'm just a tremendously amazing liar. <laughs> like, I can pretend like I'm uncomfortable with something when in actuality I am screaming inside, or I'm, I know the moment I get back to my dorm room I'm going to start screaming. Oh, having a meltdown or something like that, but I also know that there is a time and a place because uh, there isn't any safe rooms uh, available uh, in neurotypical society. Like we have to make our own, and uh, you know, on a college campus, there's not many places you can go and scream without attracting attention. The way I explain it to people is, uh, you know, people's brains like hamster wheels. Eventually, the hamster's got to take a break. Um, autistic brains aren't like that. They just keep going and going and going. So we can't stop thinking about things. Those, like, that's why a lot of kids with autism have sleep problems, because they can't fall asleep because they have too much on their brain. They, they can't sleep because they're thinking too much. And um, I think just the walking in circles, there's no thought to a circle. Like, it's just, like, so I'll just plug in my earphones so I can't hear anything else except whatever white noise I'm listening to and I'll just walk in a circle. I think it's just like we are just as prevalent as men with autism. There might not be as many as, as uh, there are boys, but um, we are still part of this movement, we're still part of this community, and we just gotta be, remind people that, hey, you know, we're here too, you know, don't forget about us. <laughs> uh, one thing I've learned is that um, First off, I'm not the only person who uh, is speaking from their own perspective. Like, I feel like I go to some of these conferences and it's a bunch of doctors and a bunch of parents who want to talk and get to know what autism is about, but there's not a lot of people on the spectrum talking about it. And so I come to these and I see Temple Grandin, who's one of the biggest faces in the autism community, actually get up and talk about what helped her and what we need to do to, in order to get our kids out of society and not in our pa uh, parents' basements. And so it's, it's just kind of reaffirming, like, I'm not the only one. Thank you. Because <laughs> I'd go to these and I would be the only one. I'd be next to a bunch of doctors and talking about worlds I have not even seen before, let alone pronounce. And I'm just sitting here like, I did a pageant once. <laughs> so it's good to know, like, I'm speaking from a perspective of, uh, not necessarily overcoming, but learning to live with uh, this because I feel like not a lot of people come out and say what it's like to live on the autism spectrum. Um, a lot of people talk about their struggles and everything like that, but they don't talk about you know, what they've done to uh, make their lives better uh, while living on the spectrum. <laughs>
after we've paid all of the other expenses. We are here today because um, I my goal is to be independent and also I would like to share all my artwork and I would like to sell. Thinking about at his young age being a businessman, you know, it's it's amazing. I uh, cannot be more proud. And we are back with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And I, we wanted to talk just a couple of minutes. There's been a couple of stories in the news lately, and there was one in particular that that really got to me because it felt personal to me. Uh, a story in Atlanta that uh, a young boy, nine years old, on the autism spectrum, and he was going to summer school, and then he was supposed to transition to this after-school program. And um, the mom went to pick him up, and he wasn't at the after-school program, and they were like, oopsie, what happened? And somebody had put him on a bus, the bus driver took him home, opened the doors, let this nine-year-old on the spectrum off the bus. Without a parent picking him up. Without a parent nothing. picking nothing. He, he went to the door, and of course, mom wasn't home because she thought that he was at the program. Right. And fortunately, he sat down on the front steps. It was really hot. By the time mom got to the school, mm -hmm. saw that he wasn't there, panicked, mm -hmm. went home. He was he was still sitting on the porch. He had sat there for three hours. So he was overheated, and he yes. was probably distraught. And, but of other course. Than, but and no the mother was distraught as well and said, you know, anything could have happened. And she said, I don't know how the school could have made this mistake and the school has said you know it was human error and that no one's going to be reprimanded and the mom said this is especially shocking because they'd already done this once before a year ago right and and so on the one hand you know I, I want to be clear this is blatant negligence on the on the, on the fault of the, of the school, the school. Mm -hmm. um, this is not the mom's fault in any way shape or form but I want to say to all of us I know I'm one of those helicopter parents that's always at the school and asking things and you know and and you know double checking and a lot of times over the years I've had teachers one teacher in particular who was like oh my goodness what you know this is about you and why don't you trust us and da 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 da, da. Um, and and I said because I've seen far too much right so this is my kid forgive me if I'm not going to take a chance on what you say because you got a lot going on. And this, she said to me about a field trip that I insisted that I was going to go on, a field trip that while I stood there, the bus that my son was supposed to be on pulled out of the parking lot and left without my son. Uh -huh. And I was like, mm, yeah, no, good thing I'm here. But <laughs> in any case, I think we all need to get a thicker skin about being sure that people are doing their jobs. And when they look at us and think that we're crazy, just you know, yeah, just letting that roll. Keep going through because you've got to, it. It is so much of it is on us, and we have to protect our kids. And as much as I would love to say to you, oh, be trusting and loving and whatever, uh, I, I, I don't think you wait for a strike. But if you no. get a strike, I mean, God bless this mom that she was able to get to the point where she once again trusted these people. But clearly, they were not deserving of it, right. and that is not her fault. No. Um, but I certainly hope that she doesn't, because you, you know the principal is already saying we'll never do it again. Right. Well, that's right. You won't, because I would be on the phone every day saying, you know, you text me when you have him from one program to the other, and that's the only way this is working. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't care. I'm at that point. I don't know how you feel, Nancy, but. <laughs> I don't care no, what they say about me. I don't me. care either. I mean, I'm going to be all over it if something happens. I, I think we have to. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I think about what that mom had to have gone through knowing that her kid sat there for three hours, it's, and, and at nine. Yeah. You know, I, where I, I personally don't think that nine-year-olds need to, whether neurotypical or not, I think they still need supervision. Yes. I know that there are people who don't agree with me on that and bless them. Uh, I don't know what their circumstances are, but you know, I think that nine year olds need supervision and you don't ever just drop off a kid and hope no. that somebody's home. Um, but somebody put him on the bus too. It's not just the bus driver's right, fault. Right, right. Uh, anyway, I, I, so I've so talked a lot. So we have to be the monitor really of these things. 
I don't know who else could be. I don't either. And it's one more thing, and maybe that's why our and houses maybe, are upside down. Maybe that's down. why we're overwhelmed these days, because yes. we know we've got a lot of these responsibilities. And it up. is, I, I always say to people when I'm turning my kid over to them, this is the most important thing in my life. I am entrusting you with the most important thing in my life. And so I want to know about those people. Mm -hmm. I want to know that they're worthy of that kind of trust. I love how schools and doctor's offices just think that we're supposed to, oh, you know, you have a, a, you know, letters after your name. That means you're trustworthy. We know. We've done the stories here. We know that that doesn't follow. Uh, it makes me nuts. But be, you know, my thing always is that my personal belief system is that sometimes there's a lesson, mm -hmm. and sometimes you're the lesson, but sometimes you're not. Sometimes somebody else gets a lesson, and it can be tragic or not, but it's our responsibility to learn. So here's this mom who went through something, and it was a lesson. And thank goodness her child is okay. But for the rest of us, let's just take note and be extra diligent as school starts to make sure that there are no misconnections. Yes. As I'm saying this, I, 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 I have to disclose that part of the reason why I've always been paranoid about these things right. is that my very first day of school ever, back in 1960, whatever, uh -huh. uh, when I went off to kindergarten, my mother put me on the bus to go to kindergarten. Right. I went to kindergarten. I stood there and told the teacher a million times, I'm supposed to, I see my sister over there, I'm supposed to be on the bus with her. And mm -hmm. she said, no, honey, this is the bus for you. Get on the bus and wait for your she stop. She was wrong. She was wrong. And my stop never came. And the bus driver was going back to the bus garage as I was sitting on the back. Because she told me, wait until your stop comes up and right. then get off. I didn't, I'd never been on a bus before. Right, right. So I sat there and it didn't come up. And I was being silent. And I was at the back of the bus. And he was taking it back to the bus garage. And I heard the radio go off and say, you know, hey, do you have any kids left on your bus? And he said, no. And I knew that wasn't true, so I spoke up and said, I'm still here. You didn't get to my stop yet. And he was like, what? He didn't even see you there? No, he didn't know I was there. And, and, and he said, yeah, apparently I do have a kid. Well, I was verbal. So when, you know, when we had Paul that died on the bus uh, yeah. a couple of years yes. ago, like it really, really took me back you. because... I know what it's like to be left on the bus, but I was able to say, Here I am. I'm here. You didn't take me home. I yeah. was able, if I hadn't been able to say that, right. he would have taken him, took that bus and parked. Now, instead, he took me home, and my mother was there hysterical and saying, Why didn't you get on the right bus? And I said, I tried to get on the right bus, but that woman made me get on this bus. I tried to tell her. So, this is deeply uh, personal for you. It, well, I just know that stuff can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I've also been a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen things, you know? Um, it, it isn't easy to be, especially in our school system now, to be in charge of a bunch of different kids. There have to be safety precautions in place. But if there aren't enough, we have to lobby for more. Um, but yeah, I'm paranoid because I know firsthand how easy it is. And I could talk. Those kids can't. In any case, be your kid's advocate. We, we have to continue to do that. And you're right. Maybe that is part of the feeling of being a little overwhelmed these days, too. Which I think that comes with the territory, it. and that's okay. And it's good that our kids are going to school. And there are lots of people that are trustworthy. They are. But until you know... Assume not is my motto. And there's going to be a bunch of school administrators that are going to hate me for saying that. But hey, these are our kids. These are our kids. And, you know, we can't be too careful. No. But get them off to school, double check, do whatever safety double checks you have to do.